All right, we are moving on to 9.0, which is citizens participation. Lexington County School District 1's Board of Trustees solicits the advice and counsel of its citizens. To encourage this participation, the board provides a citizens participation period during board meetings. In order to speak, you must be the parent or legal guardian of a student currently attending a Lexington District 1 school, a taxpayer residing in the Lexington District 1 attendance area, an employee of the district, or a student, student currently attending a Lexington District 1 school. You may comment on agenda items, school operations, policies, programs, or other matters. You may not speak about specific individuals, where, whether they are students or staff. We want to remind you that this meeting is being live streamed and the recording of this meeting will be part of the public record in perpetuity. We want to give everyone who came tonight an opportunity to speak. And in order to do that, I will call on each of you by name and ask you to approach the lectern at the back of the room. The board will not reply to your remarks nor take any action during the board meeting in response to your comments or questions. You may address the board for up to three minutes. If you have any handouts you would like the board to review, please give them to Ms. Halliday in the back of the room and she will distribute them. Please do not clap or make any comments, either while an individual speaks or after he or she finishes. As you came in tonight, you received a card to fill out to indicate you wanted to speak. That card asks for your name, address, and other information. However, we will read out only your name, the town you reside in, and the name of the schools your children attend when it is your turn to speak. If you are unable to attend this evening or are uncomfortable addressing the board in person, you may reach out to the board by email, telephone, or mail. Of course, the way the mail is going, we'll get it in April. Um, and our contact information is available on the Lexington One website. We welcome all messages. All right. First, we have Miss Debbie Myers. And Miss Myers lives in Lexington. And I believe that she has a granddaughter in one of our schools? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Taxpayer. G.K. <laughs> Chesterton once said, America is the only nation founded upon a creed. That creed is defined as having two components, that we as a nation believe a God who created the universe, that our rights come from him, and that government's primary duty is to protect those God-given rights, not to undermine them. The rights of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, freedom of speech, thought, religion, assembly, the right of self-determination. These tenets have been under assault for decades. Having observed governing boards, this one included over 30 years or so, I've watched while they wrestled away rights and responsibilities that were never theirs to possess. While many, as agents of the state, continue to tear down and make obsolete the tenets, obsolete, the tenets upon which our nation was founded, I am here to state a biblical truth. You answer to a higher authority and will one day be held account by God for all your actions. I would take this seriously if I were in your position of authority. I'm here out of concern. If I didn't care about you, I would not be here tonight. James 4, 6 says, God sets himself against the proud and haughty, but gives grace to those who are humble enough to receive it. Over the past 20 months or so, the handling of this man-made global crisis has been both stunning and revealing. It was evident to me of a student, as a student of education shift, that this situation and the actions that followed had very little to do with the virus and everything to do with exerting control over those who are in your charge. I am painfully aware of how many people have died, thousands of them, at the hands of malfeasant government or health entities. That's not disputable. The truth is readily found, and I believe you all should know the truth of the matter as we complete year two of this insanity. I've come to speak to those of you who claim the name of Christ those in this room and those who are watching online. At what point did we, as followers of Christ, decide that the worst thing that could happen to us is to become ill or even die? Scripture's clear on this matter. Philippians 121, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We all are going to die, it's inevitable. What we do while we live is what will matter in the end. Should we, as people of faith, be fomenting fear or sharing hope? Should we be continuing a narrative that's based on shifting science, perpetuating a falsehood, or should we speak truth in life? I speak life. I believe in the creator of the universe as our founders did. I will stand before him knowing I've done and said what I believe he has called me to do and to say. Many have suffered because of the heavy-handed tactics of governmental entities. <clears throat> will you be the ones to put an end to this, or will you continue? Incentives to promote falsehoods are massive, and they've driven much of what's taken place over the last two years. Will this district continue to do what's required in order to keep the money flowing? Probably so. Or will we replace the calls for face coverings with encouragement to go outside, breathe fresh air, and exercise? Stop pushing for injections of an experimental drug, and instead encourage a healthy diet and nutrition. 
Isaiah 48 warns that there's no ultimate peace for the wicked, the stiff-necked, obstinate, and doer. As you sit unresponsive to my concerns by design, that chapter of the Bible may be considered a call to repentance or at the least to self-examination. Let's now speak to the mitigation measures set in place over the past few years. Scripture speaks to it. Thank my, you, Ms. Myers. My friend Appreciate will continue it. that. Thank you. Next, we have Michelle Fagan, and Ms. Fagan lives in Lexington. James 5.14 asks, Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. I do not see the words mask up or isolate, social distance, and that do you. Jesus healed lepers, cast out demons, and made righteous the sinner. That includes me. That is why I'm pleading with you. Stop what you're doing. Repent for the actions that have caused fear and panic. Turn away from them. It is not too late to do the right thing. 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. This is the greatest promise ever made to humankind. To those who do not claim to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, I now plead with you. Choose this day to put aside your wicked ways of this decaying world. Turn to one who can save from the eternity of separation from God. John 3, 16 to 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved by him. We recently celebrated Christmas, Christ's birth, also known as the Incarnation. He came as a helpless baby 2,000 years ago. However, when he returns, he will return as a conquering king. But first, he will call up those of us who have anxiously awaited so long for his appearance. We pesky truth-seeking Jesus followers will be gone from this earth, and chaos will truly begin. I sincerely hope and pray that you will not be among those who are left to scoff this truth, that you will not be left behind. Examine your hearts regarding the authority you have been granted, and whether it has been utilized for good or ill. Has every opportunity to be respectful and loving been used in this manner? Let's examine our own hearts using the word of God as a guide, because God is the one who knows what our hearts better than we know ourselves, and his word speaks for itself. We're milling willing vessels for his use. I hope you can hear my heart in this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, silence is the fact of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. I'm not calling you evil. I'm calling the spirit and agenda behind this worldwide chaos evil. God is not the author of confession and chaos. Satan is. John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they would have life and it has have it abundantly. We have seen the enemy's handiwork, gender confusion, enmity between ethnicities, destruction of marriages and families, death and destruction, corruption and confusion are rampant. Will you step up and speak for what is right, or will you stand by and allow this to continue? Now is the time to choose. I believe the Lord may be speaking to some of you right now by the power of the Holy Spirit as you hear these words. Please do not turn away from this. Accept him now. Thank you for allowing us to speak. Please enter this document in its entirety into the permanent record for this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fagan. Next, we have Ms. Danielle Bowers. Ms. Bowers lives in Lexington and has students at Lake Murray Beachwood and LHS. Almost two weeks ago, my seventh grade son was quarantined for being in close contact with a team member on his basketball team. The principal would not and could not provide any proof of this. It was just because she said so. This meant that eight, in, my son including and including eight incredibly healthy boys could not play in their basketball game until the quarantine time limit was up or where they were tested and would wear masks. Um, but we went to the game that night anyways to see if the kids that were vaccinated were allowed to play. They had to wear masks, which um, running up and down the court, we all know that could be severely not good as you're trying to exert yourself that much. Um, but ironically enough, those young men that were wearing the mask had them on their chins, barely, some barely on their mouths. Um, these, some of these uh, young men were students of administrators um, and teachers. Um, I have video and photo proof of this. Um, let's keep in mind also that the boy who tested positive for COVID was fully vaccinated. I then, when this all started, I received a call from the principal. They said they would keep my son in isolation all day if I did not come pick him up. My child has two diagnosed learning disabilities and you as a district and your guidelines and protocol were willing to leave him in a room all by himself with a computer and say, you do it. Um, this is failing our kids 
online learning is a joke for the most part. Um, I then received an email stating that if I brought my healthy child back to school, the same thing would happen. He would be left by, alone by himself in a room. Um, that's right, a healthy child with no symptoms, two learning disability, disabilities would continue to be segregated and discriminated against, even though there was zero proof that he had actually had close contact with the student in question. Does this seem like fairness and equality? I think about, as you were just speaking about, are we willing to do what's right in the matter or are we willing to follow the law? We're asking you to do what's right in this matter. It's convenience-based is what you're asking when you were discussing Ms. Garris's opinion. You can tell me all day it's because the laws you have to follow, but we all know that it's because of money. We pick and choose how it feels and what we want to do. We know the PCR test isn't, isn't accurate. That, that, those, that virus and that stuff can stay in your body. It's been said. Everybody knows it. Why are we telling students in order to come back to be healthy and to learn, you have to take a test that we know is not accurate. It will fail. Um, when the CDC director was asked about this, she said, it really has a lot why they changed the guidelines. It really has a lot to do with what we thought people would be able to tolerate. So not science, just you know, what level of tyranny are, we, are you willing to accept? That's where we're at with the school board and the superintendent. We're done accepting tyranny. We're done quarantining over, over cold symptoms. This is ridiculous. I have a kindergartner. She's afraid to go to school and cough or sneeze. She's not even sick, but she's afraid to go to school and cough or sneeze because an adult will send her home to just be there because she can't be at school with her friends and learn and love her teacher. Um, this is ridiculous. Concentrated power has always been the enemy of liberty. And this is what we're seeing. Thank you, Ms. Bowers. Next, we have Lorraine Robbins. Ms. Robbins lives in Lexington and has students uh, or a grand, granddaughter that li goes to Sac Father. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here on the behalf of Madison Elise Johnson. She's a student at um, Sysagatha Elementary. She's a kindergarten. Um, she was put out of school due to a she was uh, in the presence of uh, another child that was positive with the COVID-19, and um, she was put out for that reason. But I just feel that it's very unfair when uh, the teacher's supposed to be supervising the students. They little children. They don't understand. And the teacher's supposed to be supervising them, keeping them six feet apart. They don't know what six feet is. So if they not instructed, move back or get over against the wall, they are gonna continue doing what they do. So I just feel that it's very unfair to do a child like that, put them out of school and the child that's positive have contaminated the whole class. And you're gonna put a few kids out, I feel that you should put the entire class out until it's uh, deeply clean because the germ is still in the room, the walls, the doors, the desk. It, everything is contaminated. And I feel that another child coming behind that contaminated child, they getting contaminated too because the germs are still living on the surface. So that's, that's my point of view tonight, because I, I feel that the germs just keep going. If we don't have nobody to deep clean or to eliminate the germ, it's still there. Even when they go to the bathroom, first thing they're going to touch is the door, being a child, because they, they just figure they're trying to get in and get out. And then the next thing, they're going to use the bathroom. They're not even going to wipe the toilet off. They're a the kid. They're just going to set them. And then they're going to touch the flusher. So that's contaminated. Everything contaminated. So I just feel that it just keeps going on and on and on. And I feel that it's very unfair to put the little kids out of school like that when they dare to be supervised by the teacher. And they're going to put some out and don't put the whole class out until it's clean. Thank you, Ms. Robbins. Next, we have Ms. Catherine Reynolds. Ms. Reynolds lives in Lexington, and I believe her students are homeschooled this year. Yes, I'm 
taxpayer. Um, so I come again tonight to offer again to support two teachers, support two parents, grandparents, and also to support the bus drivers. Um, you know, it's scary. You know, here we are, we depend on these bus drivers every single day, you know, to get our kids safely from school to home, from um, home to school, all of that, right? And there's people out there that could care less about what happens to those kids while they're driving right past that stop sign that says, you know, um, for the kids to get on and off the bus, okay? That, to me, is scary because if these children are getting on the buses and they're trying to cross the street and some guy decides to, or some girl, excuse me, uh, decides to go ahead and just keep driving, what kind of consequence happens to those people? Nothing. Why? Because the school buses don't have cameras. If y'all had cameras in front of, in the front to monitor these cars that decide to continually go past and put these children at safety at risk, that would eliminate us so much of that, I think. Second thing is these bus drivers, I've heard of instances, believe me, I've heard of instances of them being attacked. What are you doing to help these bus drivers? They need cameras inside as well. I believe that these children, yes, they could be stressed out. Well, I, there's so many theories of why these children are stressed out right now. Socially and emotionally, these children are at the brink. These parents are at a brink, okay? So here you are. These, this, we have one bus driver having all these students. Something happens on those, bu on those buses. You guys have no evidence. You guys have nothing because most of the buses don't have any kind of monitoring system like that. These children are at risk. My children's safety is 100%, whether that is going on the bus to school, coming, or even in my own vehicle. You guys need to put more emphasis on helping out these bus drivers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Next, we have Ms. Stephanie Berkowitz, and she lives in Lexington. I just wanted everybody to look at me. I was curious how long that would take. Um, so today is exhausting, um, let's be honest. I had lunch recently with a board member, and it's probably not uh, who you might think. And I was asked if I ever came and said anything nice. And I said no. And my response to that was, does the board ever in turn say to the parents, we hear you, we feel your pain, we see the damage, we are here for you. And the response was no. And I said that, that that's okay, you know, and it's a two-way street. And so the reason I took last meeting off was because I needed to think about how I was going to approach everybody. And the bottom line after praying about it is we're at war, literal, literal war. And so I'm going to start changing this up a little bit because nobody much much listens here, but I'm gonna to talk to the thousands of parents that we can all see on the YouTube clicker at home that watch this. So this is for all of you who are gonna listen. What do we do? How do we change this, okay? This particular meeting brought up an instance where this person said, you're not gonna scare the board when you say you're coming for their seats. And I said, oh no, that, that is not my intent. That is me being upfront with what's going to happen next year. That's a promise. So parents, what do you do, okay? We have a board member now, currently, supporting a state superintendent candidate running as a Republican who has voted over and over and over again for mask mandates. That's Kathy Manis, she uh, is a town of Lexington. For those of you watching at home who don't know, she's running for state superintendent. If you want masks, if you want mandates, if you want vaccine mandates, if you want complete tyranny in your schools, vote for her. If you don't, pay attention to what we have to say. Um, 
We have a board member that's going to be running candidacy for next year. His name is Aaron Grenade. You want change? You want somebody to stand for you parents? You want somebody to stand for what we believe in, parental autonomy? Pay attention. Vote for Aaron. There will be two more candidates coming soon. Don't worry. So again, my intent here is changing. OK, um, why don't I have anything nice to say? There's no time for pleasantries in war. There's just not. And I agree with what Kyle Guyton said many weeks ago, where he said, the thing I hate about COVID the most was what it's done to our community. And that was something I did agree with. Um, it has torn people apart. And that's because we're at war. And I simply refuse to compromise my family's well-being for money. My last note following somebody else is for you parents watching. If you don't know why this is happening, research ESSER funds. Our kids have been sold for $27 million to Lexington One only. OK? So I'm here for change, and we're going to change it up a little bit. Thank you all. Next, we have Ms. Sarah Mail. Is it Mail? Did I get that right? Did I pronounce that right? Hi, it's Maley. Maley I, I go by I both. I apologize, Maley. And um, <laughs> no. Ms. Maley lives in Lexington and has students that attend Midway and Meadow Glen Middle. Great. Well, I'm specifically talking tonight about the rezoning um, to Lakeside Middle. But first and foremost, I want to thank you for all that you do to support this amazing school district and that I'm very grateful to live in. So I have three kids in the French Immersion Program, a sixth grader at Meadow Glen, and then I have fourth and second graders at Midway. My goal here today is to share with you that I support the current proposal of French Immersion switching from Meadow Glen Middle School to Lakeside Middle School, specifically and especially for the current class of the sixth graders that are at Meadow Glen right now. Many families and I were excited for this decision as it allows us to be in district, have access to school transportation, and allow my kids to be in the same school as their friends in the neighborhood. Understandably so, this is not what some other families would prefer. In common with change, those that oppose the change voice their concerns quickly and loudly. I want to share with you that there are many, many families pleased and supportive of the current proposal to move French Immersion to Lakeside. The swaying factor for me and for the families that currently have a sixth grader at Meadow Glen and a younger sibling in fourth grade, both in French Immersion, is the current proposal will have them both at Lakeside Middle when they are in eighth and sixth grade. If the district chooses to allow the grandfather exception that leaves the current French Immersion sixth grade class at Meadow Glen to finish at Meadow Glen, then in order to stay in French Immersion, my family will have two middle schoolers at two different middle schools. This will be a significant transportation hardship that my family would have to navigate. So in summary, I support the current proposal of French Immersion, including the current sixth grade class that's at Meadow Glen to switch to Lakeside next year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maley. And next we have Kimberly Reen. Is it Reen? Reen? Um, and Ms. Reen lives in Lexington and has um, a student at Meadow Glen Middle. So I'm new to this, and I did not prepare anything to, write, to read. But um, again, thank you so much. We are, we're very lucky to live in this district, and we love it. Um, I'm also in favor of the switch of the immersion moving to Lakeside. Um, my son actually considered dropping out of the program last year to attend Lexington for transportation issues. And Madam Scott and Madam Bear Moss and Ms. Locklear begged us to reconsider because he's doing so well. Um, so we're providing transportation for him. I do it for him. And um, he's very, very excited to go to the school. And again, I know there are a lot of parents fighting the change, and I wanted to make sure that you knew that we were very supportive of the change. Um, we were also zoned for Midway when we moved here, and we started there, and it was taken from us. We got rezoned again. So I've been providing transportation for five years, and it's been very challenging, something that we committed to do, and that's fine, but we're very excited to have a bus again. Um, either way, it'll be fine, but I just wanted to thank you and hope for the best. Thank you, Ms. Green. Oh, 
oh, we have young Mr. Ring. Um, and I believe that he is a sixth grader at Meadow Glen Middle School. Um, so, You're good. You're good, buddy. Tell us um, what you want us to hear. I just want to go to Lakeside because I have a lot of neighborhood friends that are going there. Um, um, it's close to my house and I have a bus. I would have a bus to help my mom out. Um, and you like the French immersion program? Yeah, can you say something in French? <laughs> um... I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I want to try out for the football team, and I'm not sure which team to, or when I should, if I should try out for Medellin or Lakeside because I'm not sure which school I'm going to yet, and it would be a huge problem if I tried out for the wrong team. So. <laughs> It's a very practical reason to want to know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Good job. Um, next, we have Mr. Murray Kynard. Mr. Kynard lives in Lexington and has three children that are graduates of our schools. I want to begin and end the same way, and that's by saying to you board members, Dr. Little, the other staff and administration that are here, thank you. Thank you for leading this district. I am a proud graduate of this district. I have three children who are graduates of this district. And I don't lightly say we live in the finest school district in the state of South Carolina. And if it's not the finest, I beg someone to give me four that are better, that doesn't put us in the top five. And folks, it's been that way since I moved here in 1978 as a nine, 10-year-old little boy. All but four years that I was in college, one year that I went after schooling and another at higher education had been spent right here in Lexington. I lived in this town when there was no McDonald's, no Burger King, no Hardee's. When people say Lexington, there is one word that comes to mind, growth. Maybe the word explosion. People talk about growth happening in phases. Well, folks, it's been happening for 45 years in this community. And let me tell you what the one constant has been in this community. Lexington School District 1. Lexington School District 1. Gilbert, I tell people, looks a lot more like my Lexington, the Lexington I grew up in, than the Lexington today. Why is that? People are clamoring, demanding to come to this district. Why? Because we're the best. And you know what? This board makes decisions, this administration makes decisions, had three kids that come through. And guess what? I don't agree with every one of them. But guess what? That's okay. But what I am here to say is that, you know what? We're getting something done right. We may not make, and I say we, I'm not part of the we. You all may not make the best decisions in every situation. You may make decisions that anger me or make me mad. But you know what? At the end of the day, we are who we are. And that's the best. And I want to end this the way I began it, by saying to each one of you individual board members, thank you. To saying to Dr. Little, who I don't know personally, thank you. Saying to the administration and the staff that are seated around the room, any parents, any teachers, staff that may be watching at home, thank you. Thank you for making this a place that everyone wants to come to. We wonder why real estate prices are skyrocketing. 
It's been going on here for 40 years, folks. It isn't a new phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conner. Next, we have Holly Waldrop. Ms. Waldrop lives in Lexington and has students at Midway and Middleman Middle. Good evening, everyone. Um, like you said, my name is Holly Waldrop, and I have a sixth grader who is in the French Immersion Program at Meadow Glen Middle currently. Um, we are very thankful to be a part of the French Immersion Program and to know that French Immersion will be taught either at Lakeside Middle or Meadow Glen Middle. Both are great schools with excellent administrators, educators, and expeditionary learning practices. I am here tonight to voice my support of the district's plan to rezone the French Immersion Program from Meadow Glen Middle to Lakeside Middle, including the rising seventh grade immersion class. By this, I mean the kids who are sixth graders right now. Prior to this proposed rezoning, more than half, about 60%, of the students in our current sixth grade immersion class are not zoned for Meadow Glen Middle, where French immersion is currently taught. According to the district's proposed rezoning, more than 80%, a significant majority, of these immersion students will be able to attend Lakeside Middle in zone, allowing this majority to stay in French immersion, have access to district transportation, and to attend school with other students in their neighborhoods. Many families, including mine, in this French immersion class who are currently out of zone attending Meadow Glen Middle, we were in zone when we started the program in 2015. As a result of a previous rezoning, we were moved out of zone and had to choose. We had to stay, to stay in the program or to go to school out of zone. The district's current proposed plan not only brings all of these affected families back into zone, but allows for a larger percentage than ever before of this French immersion class to be both in French immersion and attend the school that they are zoned. This is great news. In addition, I don't agree with using the survey to allow one group of immersion parents to vote another group of immersion parents out of zone using the grandfather clause. Zoning is a decision that the district should make based on community statistics and thoughtful research. The district's current proposal seems like a logical and well thought out plan and I and many others support you moving forward with it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Waldrop. Next we have Ms. Katie McCown. Ms. McCown lives in Lexington and has students at Midway, Meadow Glen, and Riverbluff. I would like to focus my attention to the parents that might be listening in tonight. Um, I listened to a very important podcast with Dr. Robert Malone, who developed the mRNA technology for the vaccine experiment and is now speaking against it based on the data collected over the last two years. He says, and I quote, in talking about what's happening to our children in particular, the psychological damage of these lockdowns or quarantines, the mask use, the school policies, the bullying of children who are vaxxed, the psychological damage is huge. We're having a worldwide epidemic of suicide in children. We're having a huge surge of drug abuse in adolescents. We're having demonstrative drops in IQ and fundamental developmental milestones in very young children. Children have to see faces to learn how to speak and interact socially. We're raising a generation of children that have been blocked from their ability for their brains to assimilate the information necessary for them to become functional citizens. And parents, we are destroying it without a second thought and the damage is going to last for generations. As if that's not bad enough, we're allowing the state to insert itself into the family and make decisions by mandating vaccination experiments. We're setting up a situation where children are going to see peers who have been vac vaccine damaged as a consequence of policies that their administrators and their government forced on them, end of quote. To put it into perspective, our Lexington One School District has offer, has, was offered three payments and ESSER funds from the federal government. Free money, you might think, 
but we always know there is a catch with government money. They say, if you want this money, then you must follow our rules. Rules include things like contact tracing, strict quarantine guidelines, lots of reporting to the government, mask wearing, lots of testing, etc. This is why our kids have suffered. This is why they are so behind, and this is why there is so much learning loss. Our district sold our children and their right to a good education in three payments for $42,416,736. I say give it back. Our superintendent and his buddy Jeff Salters, our CEO and COO, Ms. love to talk about how transparent our district is. But I bet none of you can tell me where this money has gone or is going. Since this board is unwilling or unable to make changes we need in response to quarantine guidelines, because to some of you, our superintendent is our knight in shining armor, we can do, who can do no wrong, I implore parents to get more involved, follow the money, and in November, please vote for the people that will stand up for your children and not bow down to government money. Next, we have Ms. Summer Adams. Ms. Adams lives in Lexington and has students that attend Lexington Middle and Riverbluff High. I'm here tonight to plead with you guys to please get rid of the DHEC protocols. They are hurting our children. Last week, my son was quarantined, a healthy student, supposedly in two classes, but they couldn't prove it and no one was really sure. Well, I brought my student back to school and said, we're not leaving. He's going to be attending school. He's healthy. When he's sick, I keep him home. And um, my child was almost about to be able to stay until the principal and I sat there for two and a half hours and he wasn't sure what to do and he didn't know what protocols were and he had to make phone calls back and forth. He couldn't answer half of my questions, no, nine out of 10 of my questions. Um, it was very frustrating. A healthy child who was already catching up from actually being sick, not COVID related, and was working on some assignments trying to get them done for the end of the semester. It was so frustrating that he had been studying, studying, studying for a couple of tests that he was supposed to make up that day. And then the principal said, oh, he just won't be, it won't be counted against him. He doesn't have to take it. That is poor education. That is not acceptable. As a parent, I expect my kid to receive instruction. I expect him to do his work and be graded based upon performance. I also expect that he take those tests, not that it, he just get a free pass. Well, he was given a free pass, and even he was annoyed. He was like, I expected to be tested. So that was very frustrating. Um, furthermore, before um, River Bluff locked down, a couple, or last week and was shut down because of, again, DHEC pr protocols and so many healthy parents and, um, or excuse me, staff members, teachers, and kids just sitting at home, um, which they didn't. We all know that we were taking them places with us and celebrating going on you know, little day outings because you should never punish healthy people. It's ridiculous. Um, I've talked to many of these people, many parents, many teachers who are frustrated with it. And again, I would say that those ESSER funds should not be accepted or given back, never ever taken again. No one can tell us where the money is. And when I sat with that principal at Lexington Middle School, I said, so what kind of instruction is my son going to be receiving while he's at home? And he said, um, just email your teachers and they'll post assignments. Unacceptable, absolutely unacceptable. I would assume there was some, some kind of Zoom, one-on-one, -on -one, um, something recorded, an alternative. There was nothing, nothing. They didn't get back to him. We still don't have responses from teachers. He's now gone back to school today. Um, it was a total fail. I know kids are freaking out. At River Bluff, a lot of them started having a little bit of a panic, panic attack. They were emotional. They didn't want to be locked down again. One kid said, I'm repeating my freshman year again because I cannot do virtual learning. It was really sad to me when my daughter came home and told me about that. Also, the, the one school that I heard of, there was a child who left suicide notes for his teachers because he was so depressed, not doing well. Um, kids are constantly anxious and depressed, worrying about being um, quarantined and they're healthy. Again, this is just... It, it's gone too far. If you're really concerned about kids, you need to show it, not just in fun programs and things and, and essential programs, but show them by letting them be in school. I had more, but that's all I have time for. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Next, we have Rebecca Godfrey. Uh, Godfrey lives in Lexington and has students at Midway and River Bluff. Things we have been told in the last two years that we never th thought we'd hear from Lexington One School District. We'll be shutting down for two weeks. Scratch that. Make it the remainder of the year. 
Your child cannot enter a building if they are not wearing a mask that is completely covering their vital airways. But don't worry, we'll have breathing breaks. Oh, they're required to sit behind plexiglass too for the entire day. Incidentally, we can only provide in-school learning for two days out of the week for the first three months of the new school year. If your child happens to come into contact with someone who tests positive, even though they're asymptomatic, they must stay home for 14 days. If it's someone in the home, make that 24. Once the teachers have a chance to get the vaccine, we can get back to normal. Scratch that. Every child from age five on up should get the experimental injection. If they don't, your healthy child be, will be quarantined with no other explanation than, according to the seating chart, they were a close contact. In order to fully participate in sports in school, your child needs to be double jabbed, and it would be nice if you kept them in a mask. Scratch that, boosters for everyone eligible. If you don't inject your child three times in a matter of six to eight months, backed by absolutely no data, you can be subjected to the dreaded quarantine again. Also, put that mask back on. What do you think this is, 1999? I mean, come on, this is getting out of control. It's time for Lexington One to use common sense and challenge DHEC's ever-changing guidelines. Every educator knows that quarantines are not the answer. Ending contact tracing in quarantines is. This would immediately solve a host of problems. We never have to have 4,000 healthy kids forced home. Because you have not challenged DHEC, kids are getting discriminated against in our schools for not being jabbed. As it stands, there's no limit to the amount of times a healthy, unjabbed, untested kid can be quarantined. Last week, the Lexington Richland Five Board passed a resolution to request that DHEC reevaluate its COVID exclusion rules to limit required quarantines only to kids who are symptomatic and positive and to remove all quarantine rules based on VAC status. They are leading the way. I hope you will join them and do something similar now that we are 700 days into this. I know you would all agree that a one-size-fits-all approach does not work for education. It does not work in the medical field either. So please stop recommending the same medical advice to 28,000 students. These decisions belong within the parent, child, and doctor relationship. Forcing a child to, who has tested negative to wear a mask which is a medical device during a high intensity basketball game without first getting evaluated and cleared by their doctor is abuse and extremely dangerous. It is also insanity. Please get back to focusing on educating our children. The amount of learning loss is mind boggling. We're talking about hundreds of hours of learning loss for each student. Closing the gap should keep us plenty busy the rest of the school year. Stop wasting your time tracking down how many healthy classmates were within six feet of a child who has the equivalent of a common cold. And it, please step up and end this COVID micromanaging nonsense. Thank you, Ms. Godfrey. Next, we have Lisa and Kim. Ms. Kim, um, she lives in Lexington and has a student at River Bluff High School. Thank you for allowing the citizens uh, participation. After I had been worrying about being quarantined for the whole semester, my sophomore son was quarantined two days before the Christmas break because he was exposed by a student who was vaccinated and who was tested positive. I made a request to the principal that he ask a teacher to send me the instructional plan. The response was to check the schoolology. Schoolology is not the substitute for certified teachers. During those two days, I didn't receive a single email from any of his teachers. That is a loss of two full day face-to-face -face instruction, which attributes to the learning loss. After one week of school, the school was shifted to e-learning for three and a half days. We received an email about the week's learning plan from two teachers. We appreciate those two teachers. However, no teachers offer instruction on Zoom. E-learning has become self learning days. During the week, on January 12th, Wednesday, we received an email informing us of a son being exposed the week before. No official quarantine requested because it's virtual already. He was in quarantine already. Our healthy students might be quarantined again, 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 again. When I ask the principal that if I send my son to school tomorrow, will you or other staff expel him? The answer was that my son is a good student. They cannot put him on a disciplinary action. With that being said, quarantine is equivalent to a suspension because you only and put the kids out of school when they have behavior problem. So the district suspends the face-to-face -face educational opportunity for healthy kids without vaccination 
for a longer period, uh, time, longer period of time compared with the vaccinated peers. Yet my child was exposed by the vaccinated one. Please stop this discriminatory act and keep healthy students at school. According to the House Bill 4100-1A69, those e-learning school districts who meet the criteria for e-learning district may use up to five e-learning days to allow for the makeup of short-term disruptions to in-person learning and teaching. My son had more than five days of e-learning for the whole school year, so the district should not quarantine him or suspend him, in other words, and anymore. And, and by the way, I also made a request for data to the board and the superintendent. As of today, I have not received any of the data. And I want to know how many healthy students quarantined end up being tested positive. What is the total loss? of the instructional hours per quarantine students and what is the total hours of all quarantined students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Next we have Ms. Debbie Heim. She lives in Lexington. Just it's really wet, and I don't want to get my papers really wet. Um, it's a fun meeting. I agree with you, sir. It's a great district, and I think we can do better. Last March, a financial and procurement audit meeting was held. This is a subcommittee, which means FOIA laws must be followed, like giving proper notice and filling out proper forms. There were four people at that meeting. Kathy Henson was a brand new board member, and Kyle Guyton had never done this meeting before. They were relying on the advice of the district office, who has done this a lot. Jeff Salters uh, said media notice was not necessary because he was following the fiscal accountability FOIA guide. In fact, he gave this exact copy to my husband when he went to the district to ask about this. This red tag, this is Jeff Salters tag, marking the place for posting advance notice. We can't talk about notice. staff. We can't talk about employees here. I'm sorry, this was said in a public board meeting. Can we stop the time, please? We've done this before. You can't do that. He said in a public board meeting that he did not have to give media notice. I'm talking about money and a committee. I'm talking about a committee meeting that two members of this board sat on. And I, and I have things to say about that. And I really expect you guys to hear it because it's been 10 months and I've been ignored a lot. I've been ignored about this and the laws have been broken and I would just like to explain it for like a final time. Is that a problem? Again, we typically do not allow personnel issues to be discussed. This is not a personnel person. issue. This is a money issue of which the board has jurisdiction. This is can a public you, can meeting. Can you speak to the issue and not the, the names of the employees? Again, yeah, feel free a, to, to reference any of the board members and Dr. Little, but our employees in Lexham 1, you need to not reference in your citizens' participation. Speak to the issues at hand. I'm sorry. I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep going. Okay. Can I get a little bit of time back for that? It was stopped. You, you stopped it after I asked you to stop it after that was going just for a continue. while. Okay, um, where it says that publicly accessible, it must be posted in a publicly accessible location and on the centralized web page if one exists for this. Um, he said that he posted a piece of paper with the meeting information on it inside this building. Our regular board meeting notices are posted at the window so they can be read from the outside. Tracy Halliday, the secretary, showed my husband where it was posted. This is how he described it. Go in the district office, upstairs, down a hallway, through a doorway that looks like you're entering a private office, then to a wall where there's a bulletin board. That is where Mr. Salters posted public notice for a public meeting. Mr. Salters mentions the meeting was not posted online because technically there's no web page exclusively for noticing meetings like this. Never mind notices are posted online all the time. This shouldn't be complicated. The rules exist to prevent secret government activity. At the next board meeting, the first thing out of his mouth when he gave this report is that it was a subcommittee, so he knew it should have been noticed legally. Instead, he hid behind this again, which gets better. The meeting goes into executive session, which means no one from the public can watch it since the meeting is to choose an accounting firm to do these audits, which is looking at our purchases or records to see if they follow policies and laws. The only people allowed in an executive meeting are other board members, but not all were told the meeting was happening. At a board meeting the next one, I listened to Jada Garris ask Mr. Salters questions about how the meeting was noticed because even she didn't know it was happening. Something isn't right when public bodies like this are holding meetings in secret from other members. Why wouldn't these four people want Jada Garris to know the meeting was happening? As far as I can tell, she has more questions about money than anyone else. A school board sets the budget and should be monitoring the expenses regularly. That is their job. That is their defined job. Time goes on. 
Recently, my husband made a FOIA request to see copies of the confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements and conflict of interest forms that, these, um, that each of these people were supposed to fill out and sign before looking at the bids according to this same guide. Uh, this is the FOIA. It came back empty, meaning these records don't exist. There are no forms, okay, which is even better because Greg Little absolutely has a conflict of interest, which is why he did not rank the forms. Is the conflict with Burkett, Burkett, and Burkett? Because that's who the committee selected, and they will be doing our annual comprehensive financial audit and our annual procurement audit for three years. Were any laws broken? Did we not notice the meeting publicly, or did we not have proper forms filled out? I mean, somebody's handled a billion dollars in this district, a billion with a B, said in a public meeting. Okay, somebody else has a conflict of interest. These forms aren't filled out, and these laws exist so secret government activity doesn't occur. It protects public funds and the people charged with overseeing those funds. Okay, this is your job. It's been pointed out several times, and you are responsible for this. What happens Thank now? Thank you, Ms. Hahn.